And we're talking about Florida. We're also talking about Puerto Rico. It's taken two weeks to get more than 90% of Puerto Rico back online after Hurricane Fiona, but there are still more than 90,000 customers without electricity, access to clean water, food, or medical care. It's reinforcing calls for more resilient infrastructure on the island. Remember, at one point, the entire island was without power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Heather McTeer Tony is the vice president of community engagement at the Environmental Defense Fund. Heather, thanks so much for taking some time out and talking to us today. Uh, we've had much stronger storms hit Puerto Rico. Maria was a high end category four. Mm -hmm. Fiona was a category one, which you might not think would leave so much damage, but both storms left residents in such a vulnerable position. Can you talk to us about that? Sure, and, and thanks so much for continuing to focus on Puerto Rico as, you know, storms continue to come across. And sometimes it's easy for us to forget that we just had a, a hurricane that happened in uh, Puerto Rico in the form of Fiona. And before Fiona, it was Maria. And that gives us a good platform to sort of identify how consistent and constant storms weaken systems. So even though... Um, when Fiona came across, it was a category one, Puerto Rico still hadn't completely recovered from Maria, which was a much stronger storm, but the cracks in the system, the infrastructure that still needs to be rebuilt, uh, is suffers even more with more and more storms that come across. That's why you see uh, almost 90% of that island that did not have electricity, um, and we're still in the process of seeing how it's going to be restored. But again, we're also getting ready to prepare for another storm to come through. That's why taking climate action and creating climate resilient infrastructure is so important. Yeah, let's let's be real though. This has been a problem since way before Maria even. You know, I feel like this has maybe just brought it more into the spotlight. This island has needed help for a long time. Absolutely. And when we look at all the islands throughout the entire Caribbean, we know that there are weak spots where we need to ensure we have climate resilient infrastructure to ensure that the people who live on those places, not just those folks who go to tourists, but uh, be tourists, but also the people who live in the places who are experiencing the everyday struggles of being in the path of storms and increased climate change impacts. So you're absolutely correct. This is not a new problem, and it's a problem that's fraught in frontline communities, environmental justice communities mm -hmm. around the country. Yeah. And, you know, so uh, it's been taken over. The electrical, electrical grid has been taken over by a new company since Maria, and we're back in the same position just after a Category 1 storm. So how do we move forward from here? Like, what, what is the solution? I think we've got a couple of things that we have to look at. Number one, this is not going to be rectified overnight. This is years in the making, and there are also years of environmental injustices and the lack of infrastructure. So it, we have to understand that it is going to take time for us to not only rebuild, but to ensure that we're building to a place of innovation and resiliency. It's wonderful to hear that our administration is going to focus on Puerto Rico, ensure that they get every single dollar that they um, not only deserve, but really need in order to ensure that we're in a climate resilient future. And then there's other great news. Look at all the innovation that's happening around solar energy and the stability of grid. So I am enlightened and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a, a bit excited to see all of these opportunities that are happening not only as a proof of concept in Puerto Rico, but in other communities around right. the country. We've got to be able to scale this. What do you think Let's in Puerto Rico real quick here. What do you think is the biz biggest obstacle to making the infrastructure better and making this happen? Well, our biggest obstacle in the face of climate change is always going to be time. And I know we want to move at the speed of light, but the reality is that communities move at the speed of trust. And so creating authentic, trustful relationships with communities so that we can not only ensure we're putting this resilient infrastructure in place, but that the community itself is empowered to keep it going, move it along, and see how we can uh, encourage other aspects of all of our communities to really jump into renewable energy. So I know time is our biggest obstacle, but next to that, the accessibility and us constantly ensuring we're putting the resources in the spaces that need it first. I think we can do those two things together, though.
with your leadership, yeah. I love when you come on the show, Heather. I always feel so empowered and ready to go and fired up when you get on and informed, by the mm -hmm. way. You do yes. it all. Yes, Heather McTier, Tony, Vice President of Community Engagement at the Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today on the show. And as she was mentioning, it, it always comes down to that community and empowering them right. and giving them the tools. Exactly. It's a long road ahead, but like she said, we move at the speed of trust. And it like seems that. like we're heading in that I direction. I like that a lot. For more stories like this,